Okay, um, welcome back to CS479 Machine Learning for 3D Data. So this is our second time to meet in this course. Uh, can everyone see my slide and hear my voice? Is everything okay? Good. Cool, okay, uh, let's get started. Uh, uh, so as I said last time uh, in this Zoom session, uh, please set your name like this. Uh, so please have your both the shirt ID and also the full name in English. And also please match your the full name uh, with your name in the key LMS. And also please turn on your the camera and then turn off your the mic. Okay. Is everyone good with this? Okay, and also as I said uh, in the last time, so we actually went over with some of the course, the logistics in this course. Uh, so if you missed uh, the first lecture of this course, uh, you can also find out all the materials, so all the uh, the slides and even the recording of the first lecture in our the course webpage. Uh, so please check out our the course webpage. And one of the important things for the course the, the logistics is that uh, all the so we basically have the program the assignments and the all the assignments are already released uh, in our the pro the, the course webpage. So please check out that. Uh, you can also check out all the details about. Uh, basically the instructions for each of the programming the assignments and what you need to do and what you need to submit. And you can also check out all the deadlines for each of the, the programming the assignment. So please check out this. And also, uh, I also talked about you know, how we want to basically distribute some kind of the computing re resources. So we have the GPUs in the K Cloud, uh, but we are having some limited number of the GPUs in the K Cloud. So we already uh, distributed uh, all the GPUs that we have in the K Cloud uh, to the undergrad the, the, the students. So if you did not receive the K Cloud GPU uh, for the undergrad the students here, uh, please let us know. And also for the graduate students, if you need a GPU, please let us know. Then we are going to try to distribute some of the GPUs there. And uh, also, if it's, if it's your the first time to use the uh, the K Cloud, uh, please check out the K Cloud tutorial, uh, which is also uploaded. Uh, into our the course webpage. And we strongly recommend you to start to work on all the things as early as possible. So it might take some time for you to basically get used to the uh, K-Cloud environment and also all the uh, things in the programming assignments. Any questions for the K-Cloud or the programming assignments? Yeah, so if you did not uh, try to use the K-Cloud, uh, please check it out. And actually there might be some technical issues with the K-Cloud. So if you have any issues with that, uh, please let us know so that you can start to work on the uh, the programming assignments as early as possible. And also, as I said last time, we're gonna have some kind of the short quizzes during the, all the lectures. And even some of the lectures may start to with some kind of the quizzes about the previous lectures. Uh, so please be prepared. And also, as I said, uh, what we are going to do is that we are going to also kind of calculate some kind of the participation score uh, based on how you answered uh, all the, the questions. So basically, you're going to get the 100% score uh, if you answered like at least 80% of the, the quizzes that we had. So that's kind of things. And also, as I said, the project, the course project is the most important part in this course. So we are going to uh, start basically group some kind of the, uh, make some kind of teams for the project. And the deadline for the team matching is the next Friday. Uh, so I'd like to also strongly encourage you to start to find the other the classmates, uh, the, the, the teammate uh, for the course project. So you can basically form a team with at most the three people and all the team members will be uh, basically will get the same grade for the project. Uh, so that's kind of things. So if you uh, don't have any kind of ideas in terms of how you're going to basically find the teammates, uh, we are also going to open a channel in this lab so that you can also start to uh, hire some kind of the teammates for your team. So that's kind of things. Any questions for the, uh, the project and also the part in class, the participation? So especially in the case that you missed the first lecture of this course, uh, please check out all the materials. The slides, the recordings are already uploaded uh, in the course webpage. Cool. Uh, and so please turn off your mic. Cool. 
Okay, so so what we discussed last time is that we briefly uh seen some kind of the applications of the 3D data. So there are some kind of the applications of like 3D generation. So we have seen some cases of like text generation, the image generation, and also we have seen that there is already some techniques that can automatically generate some kind of 3D contents. So the video you can see here was kind of the state of the art in terms of like uh making some 3D contents. And this kind of the output can be used in some many kind of you know graphics AR VR applications like Roblox or some kind of some metaverse kind of related kind of things, right? And also for the three D reconstruction, yeah, this is also kind of the state of the art in terms of the, you know if you can basically take a video of any kind of the objects or the scene, then we can also uh create this kind of the virtual objects or scenes that are basically copying the physical uh, the things uh, into the virtual world. And this kind of the technique uh, is already being used in some kind of the, um, the products uh, by some kind of the big tech the companies. So one of the example uh, was this kind of immersive view from the Google Maps, which is basically showing the whole this 3D reconstruction of the entire the city uh, in this kind of the 3D reconstruction the techniques. We also have shown, uh, seen some kind of the applications, uh, which is basically taking the 3D data as the input, not basically generating this kind of the outputs. And those kind of the uh, 3D perception the techniques could be used, some kind of the applications of the autonomous driving or some kind of the uh, robot and the scene interactions for many kind of the robotics the applications. So those are kind of the applications that we briefly discussed uh, in the last time. And in this course, we are basically going to discuss uh, some more kind of the basic and also kind of the fundamental the techniques uh, that can be used in many of these kind of the applications. So that's what we are going to do in this course. And what we are going to do at the especially beginning of like this course is that uh, we are going to discuss like two different types of the techniques, especially some you know deep learning based the techniques. Uh, the first the class of the techniques might be some kind of the encoders, basically that can take the 3D data as input. And obviously we are also going to discuss the other types of the uh, the techniques. Uh, about some decoders, which, which can basically generate this 3D data as the outputs. So we are going to uh, start all the discussions uh, with the uh, techniques about the encoders, basically that the, some the net neural networks that can take this 3D data as, as the input. And at the end, and after that, we are also going to discuss about all the techniques that can produce uh, this 3D data as the output. And before we start to discuss some kind of the 3D encoders, Actually, we are going to start with some discussions about the 3D representations. So basically the question that we have here is that how are we gonna basically represent the 3D data? So that's kind of the first things that we are going to discuss in this uh, course. Uh, especially we are going to discuss the 3D representations in the perspective of the encoders. I'll be like, how are we gonna basically uh, take the 3D data to process that uh, in some kind of the uh, deep learning the pipelines? So what would be kind of the best way to represent the 3D data? Uh, do you have any thoughts? For the representation of the 3D data, uh, what would be kind of the best way to represent the 3D data uh, with some kind of the numbers? So that's the kind of the first question. Um, do you have any answers for this? So this is like kind of one of the quizzes. Yeah, so yeah, many people basically answered with some meshes, point cloud, voxels, yeah, many things. Yeah, she, for the 3D, the interesting the aspect uh, is that there are actually a bunch of the ways to represent all the 3D data. So if we actually think about the other the data the modalities, for example, like the text, like um, text can be seen as kind of the one D sequence, right? Uh, like if for each of these the sentence that we have, uh, we can consider basically like, uh, you know, split the, the sentence into the multiple the tokens. And there are also some very conventional ways to basically map each of the token uh, in the sentence into a kind of the, some numerical the vector. Then what we end up getting is that from each of the sentence, uh, we are having some kind of a conversion into a 1D sequence with some kind of the, uh, some numerical the vectors, which is corresponding to each of the token uh, in the sentence, right? 
So actually, we can see that the text can be seen as kind of the 1D sequence. And there are some very typical way to uh, basically handle this kind of the, the 1D sequence data, right? Uh, and also, there are some other types of the data that can be seen as the 1D sequence. For example, like audio uh, might be also kind of the 1D uh, data, uh, basically having some sequence of the information. And how about the images? Like the image might be kind of the most common the type of the data that we can see in many kind of the AI uh, the related problems. And for the images, also the very typical the way to uh, represent the data might be having a 2D grid, right? Like all the image can be basically uh, represented as kind of a set of the pixels. And each of the pixels basically have some kind of the numbers, which basically representing either the intensity or the color information. So basically we are having some kind of the 2D grid uh, with the numbers for each of the, the pixels. So these are basically you know, very typical the representations for the text and the images. And also, if we also think about video, video can be seen as kind of the 3D grid, right? So in terms of that, we are having the 2D space and also the extra, the one-dimensional, the temporal domain. So in that sense, we can see that the videos are also kind of the 3D grid. So actually having this kind of the regular structure, like say having 1D sequence or the 2D grids, uh, was kind of the key in terms of like, you know, in the uh you know the advance of the neural net the techniques actually uh, as you know actually the emergence of the deep learning the technique actually came from the invention of the convolution neural net obviously you know, people are not using the convolution neural net these days like people are using more the like, transformer kind of architectures uh these days but if we see the like the beginning of the uh the kind of like how the neural network uh, the recent neural network has been developed uh, the first was this kind of the invention of the convolution of the neural net. Uh, and to apply this kind of like convolution of the operation, the key was to have this kind of the regular structure, either having like 1D sequence or the 2D grid or the 3D grid uh, to apply this kind of the convolution of the, uh, the operations. So in that sense, like even for all the 3D data that we have, uh, what we can do would be is that basically we can represent all the 3D data as the 3D grid. Uh, so as we have the pixels in the image domain, uh, we can consider the case of like having the voxels in the 3D space, right? So this might be the kind of the most, the kind of the basic idea in terms of like how we're gonna basically, you know, uh, handle all this 3D data. So as we apply all the 2D convolution in the 2D image D cases, uh, we can also consider like applying some kind of 3D convolution for the 3D data. So this can be the first idea, right? Uh, then what do we kind of the downside? What do we kind of issues when we basically have this kind of like 3D convolution in this 3D case? Do you have any thoughts? So if we think about the case of like directly extending the idea of the 2D convolution uh, into the 3D convolution to deal with some kind of 3D data, uh, what do we kind of the some downside for that? Yeah, as you said, yeah, obviously there will be some issues with the efficiency in terms of like having too much kind of the memory uh, and also the, the complexity uh, because like the complexity will basically become the cubic, uh, not uh, the quadratic things. And also it might take, it takes some more time for that. Uh, yeah, and data sparsity and the efficiency. Yeah, these will be all kind of the problems. So actually the thing is that uh, the reason that you know we are actually not using this kind of like some three D voxel representation in most of the cases is actually is that uh, the data that that we are typically interested in are basically not the volume data. So typically, what we can deal with uh, with some kind of the some you know three D scanning the technology is basically getting some kind of the surface information, not the volume information. So we are not gonna uh, get in some kind of details of like the 3D scanning the technology basically the works. Uh, but basically if we see like you know, how we typically basically get some kind of the 3D information from some kind of the 3D scanners, it's basically like shooting some rays uh, from the device to the 3D object and checking the intersection point between the ray and the, 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 the surface of the object. Which means that we are not getting the volume information. Actually, we are just getting the surface information. Right. And also for the many of the 3D some models, some CAD models that we can download from some kind of the online repositories, 
Uh, typically, the information that we have from these kind of 3D models is also some kind of the surface information, not the volume information. So which means that like for most of the cases, we're going to just have the, the shell of the objects, which is basically having the empty, the volume inside. So we are only interested in the, the surface information, not the volume information. So which means that if we are going to represent this kind of the 3D shapes, basically just the shell uh, with the 3D voxels, that will be really inefficient in terms of that many of the voxels might be just kind of empty. So actually that's kind of the issue. Uh, and also obviously yeah, there are some applications that we might need to basically have the volume information. Uh, for example, if the scanning that we are doing is not just kind of like using some typical 3D scanners, but if we actually are using some kind of the medical imaging the, the technology in terms of like, for example, like CT or the MRI, those things, uh, those will be basically the cases that we are getting the volume information, not the surface information. For those kind of the cases, obviously we're gonna uh, need to be handle some kind of the volume information and the voxel representation might be kind of the right representation in terms of that we really need to uh, apply some kind of 3D convolution. But for most of the cases, for example, like in the case like when you deal with some kind of the 3D the scanning the, the data or some kind of 3D CAD models, uh, we might just need to deal with some kind of the surface information in the 3D space. For those kind of the cases, like having the volume uh, representation uh, might be really inefficient uh, in terms of the many of these space might be just empty. So this is a, actually a kind of figure uh, from the the, uh, the other the paper, which is showing the kind of the how much kind of the uh, the space would be empty when it basically represents some this kind of two D surface uh, with the volumes uh, with the voxels. So as you can see. Uh, so basically for those kind of cases, like representing the 3D shape with the voxels, uh, actually there can be multiple ways to uh, represent the shape information with the voxels. Like one of the ways that we can represent those things might be is that like just checking whether each of the voxel is on the surface or not, right? For each of the voxels in the 3D space, uh, we can check whether the voxel is on the surface or not. So just having the binary information. So if the voxel is on the surface, then we have the one. And if the voxel is not on the surface, we have zero, right? So it's having the binary information. So for those kind of the cases, uh, we can check for how many voxels we're gonna have the, the basically the, the, the value of the one, which means that uh, how many voxels on the surface and how many voxels will be, will be out of the surface. And as you can see, as we actually increase the resolution of the 3D, the, the volumes, 3D grid, uh, as we increase the resolution from the 32 to the 64 and the 128, you're gonna see that actually very few number of the voxels will be just on the surface, which means that uh, if we have the like the volume representation with the voxel basically representation, that will be really inefficient in terms of the many of the voxels, we just have the, the value of the zero, right? Uh, so this is kind of the percentage of the volume, the voxels uh, that are basically on the surface. So when the resolution is 32, uh, only 10% of the, the voxels are on the surface. <clears throat> and also when the resolution is like 128, uh, like you know, less than 2.5% of the voxels on the surface, uh, which means that many of the voxels will have the, the value of zero. So which will be very inefficient the representation uh, when you basically have the, the 3D voxels uh, to represent the 3D shapes. But actually this was kind of the first idea in terms of like uh, developing some kind of the neural net architectures that can directly process the 3D data. So this was kind of the things that were basically happening in the 2015, around like 2015, then people started to discuss some ideas of like 3D convolution uh, by representing all these 3D shapes with the quite rural resolution in the voxels, like 32 by 32 by 32, for those kind of the cases, we could get some kind of the results, like for example, for some simple tasks, uh, like the, the classification, uh, but obviously it was, it was taking too much the memory and also the time in the training. Uh, so it's very inefficient, the system. And after that, what people uh, start to see is that, uh, well, actually we can consider in some kind of the more uh, like efficient uh, uh, the representation in terms of like not having the uniform degree, uh, but 
basically some of like having some adaptive uh, kind of resolution uh, depending on some kind of the information, the geometric information that we have. Uh, for example, we are having the bigger box, the voxels in the empty space uh, or some kind of the, the included uh, the regions. And also basically having some kind of the final the voxels uh, near the regions, uh, near the, the boundary of the shapes. So we are basically adapting this kind of the resolution of the 3D voxels uh, depending on the, the, informa the geometry information that we have. Uh, for those kind of the cases, uh, we could make some kind of slightly more efficient the, the architectures that can process uh, the 3D data. Obviously, uh, this is making some more kind of the burden or more the complexity uh, in terms of like implementation because now the structure becomes uh, quite irregular, which means that it's not that easy to apply some typical the convolution of the operations. Uh, so those are kind of the some attempts to uh, make the some the, the buffalo based kind of neural net architecture as kind of like more efficient, uh, but which is also basically increasing some kind of the complexity uh, in the implementations like all the things. And there are also some kind of architectures, uh, which is also making some kind of like engineering tricks in terms of like applying the convolution of the operation, uh, not for the entire region, but only for some kind of the regions that we are having the surface information. Uh, so for those kind of regions that contain the surface regions, uh, what's called the activity areas. Uh, so this was kind of some engineering tricks uh, to avoid some kind of the, uh, some convolution of the operations in the empty space, but only applying this kind of the, uh, the computation uh, in the active areas in a way to make some more efficient the system. Uh, but the, this was also still the cases so like taking lots of the memory and also the competition time in the training. But those are some kind of the, some, the attempts to apply some uh, the 3D convolution, the, the, the neural network uh, to handle some kind of the 3D data. So this can be like the, the kind of like one direction in terms of representing the 3D data. Uh, what would be kind of the other ideas in terms of representing the 3D data? So especially in the case that when you already have some kind of the 2D convolution neural net, for example, let's say, uh, like let's think about some cases like at the very beginning of the, the history of the like recent the neural net, all the things, uh, there are some kind of architectures that can process the 2D images, right? AlexNet, all the things. So when you already have this kind of the, the neural architectures that can handle the 2D data, uh, if you have the, the 3D the data, then how are you going to basically deal with this 3D data? To process that uh, with the 2D neural architectures. So this was kind of the one direction to extend the 2D convolution into the 3D convolution, but the even more the straightforward way to apply some kind of the 2D neural net architecture uh, to deal with the 3D data might be that we just like render 3D data into the 2D images. So if you took the uh, the computer graphics course, I mean there are you know many kind of the conventional way to basically the project the 3D data into the 2D images, right? So actually we can consider like even when we have them some 3D shape the the data, we can actually consider render this 3D data into the 2D images. And basically, you know, process these two D the images, the projected information, uh, with some kind of the conventional the two D convolution neural net. Uh, and also for that, you don't need to basically project, basically render the three D data not into a single view. Actually, you can basically render the three D models into the multiple D views. So that was also the kind of the first idea in terms of like how we're gonna deal with the three D data. So in the also 2015, there was the work uh, that was basically making the first attempt in terms of like you know, rendering the 3D models into the multiple view of the 2D images and basically aggregating all the information to do some kind of the task like the classification. So this was kind of the very simple the architecture, uh, which is directly you know, utilizing some kind of the convolution neural net uh, that can process the 2D uh, image as the input. Uh, but for that, we are basically rendering the 3D models into the multiple D views and basically to assume that we are not aligning all these 3D models in terms of the orientation, we also need to have some kind of the pooling operation, right? Uh, basically aggregating all the kind of information from the multiple D views, and that that information is to use the final the kind of the task, which can be classification for some other the tasks. So actually this idea was quite effective, like even compared with some kind of the architectures uh, that takes the 3D the voxels as the input, so this is kind of the comparison between the two cases. Uh, the first row in the, uh, can anyone see my the mouse point? Yeah, the first row is basically the case of like 
having the, the, the voxel representation to process the 3D data. And the second case is the case of like having the multi-view images uh, to solve the, the classification problem. So compared to the case of like doing some 3D convolution, actually doing some 2D convolution and just aggregating all the information was more effective uh, in terms of like getting some the better the accuracy. So actually this means that like even when you have the 3D data, uh, actually you don't need to consider uh, using some kind of some special architectures to deal with that. Actually the simplest way to basically like render all the 3D models into 2D images and using some kind of the uh, some conventional neural networks for the 2D images actually can, can be quite effective uh, in terms of solving the many problems. Actually, this is actually one thing that I really want to tell you uh, in terms of that. Even when you have some any kind of 3D data, uh, you don't need to think about the structure applying some kind of the uh, 3D uh, specific architectures for that. You can just try to just render 3D data into the 2D images and use the image the neural network. So that is really kind of the good way uh, to deal with all the 3D data. And actually, there are also some kind of the techniques, uh, which is basically not just like solving some problems like the classification. So basically, the classification uh, is the case that uh, we basically uh, were solving some, getting some kind of the global information for the entire the 3D objects. But for also some of the, the problems, like solving some kind of segmentation, uh, which is the case that we are getting the information not for the entire the object, but for each of the point, for each of the 3D shapes. For those kind of the cases that we are basically predicting the information for each of the point, not for the entire the, the, the shapes, what we can also do is that we can also try to first like project the 3D things into the 2D data, into the 2D images. Uh, we can basically run some kind of image segmentation uh, with the 2D images. And also we can consider aggregating all the information from the multiple views so that we can get basically the per point information like the labels like this. So this was also kind of the very effective the kind of the idea in terms of like utilizing some 2D neural networks to handle some kind of 3D data. Okay, so here's the question. In the BoxNet paper above, we need to introduce some notation in various through the data mesh. So this, yeah, actually, um, yeah, this is a really good question. So the rotation invariance and the equivariance is also really kind of the important issue uh, to deal with all this 3D data. So many of the cases uh, for the like 3D like you know, segmentation or the classification, uh, we can simply like assume that like all these 3D models are basically aligned. For example, uh, for the cases uh, like this chair, or in the case like when you want to classify all these 3D objects, here the question is that uh, if we have the this kind of like 3D models of the chair with some kind of the random rotation. So if we basically rotate the 3D models, 3D chair in the 3D space with some kind of the random rotation. Uh, if we want to basically guarantee that the neural net still classifies the 3D models into a chair, however we rotate the 3D models, how are we gonna basically guarantee this kind of the rotation invariance, right? So basically here the question is that, uh, the rotation basically invariance means that like, however we rotate the given the 3D data, if we want to get the same output, how are we gonna guarantee that? So that's kind of the question that we have. Uh, so this is also a very interesting question, not only for this 3D, but actually also for the 2D as well, for any kind of data. Uh, we want to basically achieve this kind of the, some transformation, the invariance or the equivariance. So we are going to get into that point in the later the lectures, but for now, we are going to assume that all these 3D data that we have are basically aligned uh, in terms of the rotation and also any kind of the transformations. But this was kind of the case that you know, even when you have some kind of the random the rotations uh, through this kind of like view pulling the operation, actually we also could get some kind of the same results of the classification. But we're gonna get into the point of the rotation invariance and the equivariance later. Okay, thank you for the question. Cool, uh, so, so we are talking about some kind of visual architectures that can basically process the multi-view images. And this actually, as I said, this is really good idea. So when you have some any kind of 3D data, uh, what I typically recommend is just not to try some any kind of some special architectures for the 3D data. You can first try to just like render all the 3D data into the 2D images and basically use some kind of the 2D neural net the architectures. So that can be first attempt for any kind of the application. And this kind of the application, uh, sorry, the architectures can be actually really good, in, especially in the case when you have some kind of the appearance information. 
So when you have not just the geometry information for the 3D models, but when you also have some kind of the appearance information like the color, texture, the materials, for those kind of cases, like especially like rendering the 3D models into the 2D images and processing them uh, can be actually really good direction uh, to handle all this data. The obviously the downside is that if you want to get some really good uh, the results, the, uh, the best with the high accuracy in many of the cases, uh, we need to render the 3D models not into a single view, but into the many, the multiple views. So typically as we have some more images, we can actually get some better accuracy in many of the tasks, which means that actually we might need to have some lots of the images for the same object. Uh, so which basically might increase the, uh, the memory and also the computation time in many of the tasks. So in the case, so we like this uh, you know, e example, like having the multi-view images for the classification, they also use the 80 views of the images uh, to just like uh, solve the simple the classification problem. So this kind of the cases, like you no, know, typically uh, when you want to use the multi-view images, uh, we might need to have some lots of images to get the high accuracy. So that might also result in taking too much the memory and the, also the competition time. And also, since this is not the case that we are directly just like representing some geometric information, we may not be able to capture some geometric details in the, the, the images. So that's kind of also the issue. Why is access over missing from in table? Oh, so yeah, so I also didn't tell you that. So there's some kind of a gray area here, some gray blocks here. Uh, so we also get into uh, this. Uh, so I'm also gonna uh, talk about like what's kind of some hidden things here. So actually, uh, the kind of thing is that uh, obviously the conclusion would be is that there is a better architecture, uh, not just using handling to some multiple images, but actually handling some other types of the representation. So that's actually what we are going to discuss later. So we are going to get back to this slide again uh, with kind of like hidden things in this great box later. Uh, good question. Any other questions for the voxels and the multiple images? Yeah, so yeah, these are basically very typical the ideas in terms of like dealing with some kind of 3D data. Well, but obviously there are some also the other types of the representation. So the other types of representation might be the point cloud. So here what the point cloud basically means that we are representing a 3D object as kind of a set of the points. So which might be the simplest representation for the only 3D things. So we are not having any kind of voxels or the images, but we are basically representing all the 3D shape as kind of a set of the points, even without having any connected information. Just, so that's why we call this uh, point clouds, just having a set of the points. So this will be the case that uh, we are having the X, Y, Z coordinates for each of the points. And probably we might also have some extra information. For example, we can have the color information where we can have some other information uh, where, we, where we can have some kind of the surface normal information here, what the surface normal basically means is that you know, if we try to basically approximate each of the local region of the 3D surface with the flat the 3D plane, the, the plane normal becomes the surface normal. So basically the surface basically normal basically means that when you want to basically approximate each of the local region with the flat plane, the normal of the plane basically means the, the normal of the surface. Uh, so this is kind of the first derivative information of the geometry. Uh, if we get into some more uh, the technical things, actually we are going to get get into this also as well uh, in the next lecture. We're gonna also discuss uh, how we can this kind of like utilize this kind of surface normal information uh, to reconstruct the continuous the geometry information. So that's also kind of the uh, really important information uh, for the geometry. But for most of the cases, for the point cloud, we are basically just having the set of the points uh, with the x, y, z coordinates. Then the question might be is that why do we need to use this kind of like point cloud in, uh, representation? Actually, this is really common representation in for especially for many of the, uh, the, the, the cases that we are dealing with, with some kind of the, some scanning the, the scan data. So if you also think about like how the 3D scanners basically work, uh, as I also mentioned in the previous slide, uh, those are typically the cases that we are basically shooting some rays into the 3D space and basically checking the intersection points between the ray and the 3D the surface, basically the objects. So they typically the output of the 3D scanning is basically a point cloud. So if we want to deal with this kind of 3D scan data, 
uh, that we might need to have, basically have some kind of the deep learning the techniques uh, that can directly also process this kind of the some point cloud information. Otherwise, which means that we might need to first like convert all these 3D scan data into the other representation like the voxels or these uh, multiple images that they might be really inefficient uh, in terms of like handling all these scan data. So basically the point cloud is basically the representation of like 3D data that are basically you know, captured from the real things using the 3D the scanners. But not only for the, some kind of scanning the scenarios, but for, also for some other kind of the applications, uh, especially for some kind of the physical simulations in the graphics or the robotics, uh, having the, this kind of like some point, the point cloud representation uh, can be quite efficient in terms of like running some kind of simulations uh, uh, in some main kind of applications. Actually, the problem with the point cloud is that now we are basically losing some kind of the regularity in the structure. So in the cases that when you have the 3D voxels or the multi-view images, basically we are having some kind of the 3D grid information or the 2D grid information with the multiple images. For those kind of the cases, we are basically having the grid structure, which means that this is really good type of the representation that we can apply the typical the, uh, the convolution the operation. But for those kind of the cases, we are not having the regular structure, okay? not having any kind of the grid structure, uh, which means that we cannot directly apply some kind of the convolution the neural net. So actually that was the reason that people did not try to just like use this kind of representation uh, to process the 3D data into the neural net because like people did not have any idea uh, how we're gonna basically deal with this kind of like irregular types of the data uh, with the convolution the neural net. So that's why, you know, uh, after that, people started to invent some kind of new architectures that can process this kind of the point cloud data. Uh, the first attempt was this point net, uh, which will, uh, which is kind of things that we're gonna also discuss in the next week. And implementing this point net is the part of the, the first assignment. So we are so called gonna get into some more details of this architecture. But actually it turns out that, you know, if we see some details about the point net, Actually, this architecture is pretty simple right? without any kind of like some, you know, convolutional operation. Uh, the point net actually could work quite well in terms of solving uh, many some of the tasks uh, with the 3D data. And also the implementation is like quite easy. And also the, the network is basically running quite fast. Uh, so after like, you know, introducing this the architecture, actually this kind of the architectures like handling the point cloud became quite the popular uh, for many kind of the applications. So that's basically what we are going to do, uh, discuss later. But obviously there are lots of kind of the downsides for the point cloud representation. Uh, what would be kind of the downside for the point cloud representations? Do you have any thoughts? Yeah, compared to the cases like having some voxels or the multiple images um, or some other representations, uh, what would be kind of some limitations of the point cloud representation? Yeah, as you said, like basically we are basically losing some information, right? Because like all the geometry is just like represented as a like set of the points. The thing is that basically we are losing some information about, for example, like the surface and the topology as well. So as you can see in this like some very extreme example, like when you have like set of the points like this, uh, we don't know whether it should be really kind of this kind of the donut like the types of the surface or this kind of like the spring kind of the shape of the lines. So there can be some of these kind of ambiguities, which means that uh, we basically uh, do not have any kind of a surface and the topology information. Uh, and because of this lack of, the, lack of this information, the point cloud, the data cannot be directly used, used in some many kind of the applications. For example, we cannot basically render the point cloud into the some kind of images where you know, in terms of like manipulating this kind of data, uh, because uh, the lack of this kind of surface information becomes some kind of the huddle to apply uh, so many kind of some uh, the techniques for that. So basically for many kinds of some downstream the applications, uh, we first need to convert uh, this point cloud into the, some other types of the representation, for example, like the mesh uh, that we can also discuss. So that's kind of the limitation of the point cloud. 
and also uh, to precisely uh, you know, capture, basically describe all the details of the geometry, uh, we also need to have like tons of the points. Uh, for example, like to capture all the details here, uh, we might need to basically have some like more than, for example, like hundreds of thousands of the points or even like millions of the points. But it, the thing is that uh, also for so many of the architectures that can process the point cloud data, uh, it's not that easy to increase the you know, resolution of the points. Uh, this because it's not easy to basically increase the number of the points uh, because as we increase the number of the points, uh, there might be some issues in terms of like some memory or some computation the time. So that's also the same issue uh, for the point cloud as well. So the other types of the representation for the 3D data might be also the polygon the mesh. So the polygon mesh is the most the common and the popular representation for the many uh, 3D data. So especially if we see many kind of 3D the CAD models, some 3D models in the, some online the repositories, uh, many of the 3D models that we can see in many of the uh, some 3D the data set are actually already represented as kind of 3D meshes. So these are also the most common and the popular representation. And this is also the most the compact form in terms of like representing the surface, uh, because now we are not only having the points, but we are also having the the connective information and also the the, the surface information represented with the the planes on uh, the three D space. So this can be the most effective representation in terms of like representing all the surface of the three uh, D volumes. So you can see the polygon mesh is kind of the graph structure, graph-like this structure, but it's not exactly the graph structure. So in the polygon mesh, basically we are having a set of the vertices and also a set of the edges it's connecting all the vertices to each other. And the, the, the difference with the graph structure is that we are also having the faces, uh, which is basically formed by basically uh, ha uh, having some kind of the, the set of the, the, the edges and the vertices. So we are having the vertices and the edges and the faces in terms of like having some kind of the uh, literally the mesh uh, over the, the in the 3D space in terms of basically representing the surface uh, in the 3D space. So that's the basically the very common the, uh, the representation of the many of the 3D data. And typically, uh, people use the triangle mesh, which is not having any kind of the arbitrary the polygon for the face, uh, but basically having the triangles for each of the face. Uh, so that's the kind of the common the representation. The issue with this kind of the polygon mesh is that uh, basically we might want to basically define some kind of the valid meshes, but actually in most of the cases, it's not that easy to uh, basically satisfy all the constraints for the valid mesh. So what would be kind of some kind of condition that we can consider as kind of the some validity of the meshes? Uh, for what kind of the cases, uh, we can say that the mesh structure is kind of the broken or some, some kind of issues. Or the, what would the cases that we can say that the, the mesh structure is kind of like solid uh, in terms of representing like the, the, the surface in this, this radius space correctly. Uh, the question here is that it's a more abstract way that we can still think of the point cloud as a metric space, or is it just like topological space? The question boils down whether we can have a metric or not, for example, when working with some boxes we do. Uh, so actually, also, even when you have the point cloud uh, as a metric space, uh, metric space might be kind of the other things, but in terms of like topology, uh, so we can also consider like um, somehow getting some definitions of the topology with the point cloud in terms of like uh, defining the connectivity of the points. Uh, so actually there's kind of a whole theory about that, uh, which is about the persistent the homology things. Uh, so if you basically Google the persistent the homology, what you can see is that uh, you can basically see some kind of theory in terms of like how we can define the topology uh, in terms of like, you know, connecting all the points based on their the proximity. Uh, for example, uh, even when you have this kind of a set of the points, actually we can consider basically making some kind of like forming some kind of the edges and the faces uh, based on their the distance. For example, if the points uh, are basically close uh, enough, enough, basically if the distance between the points is below this threshold, we can connect all the points, basically forming the edges. And in that way, you can also basically form the faces as well. So in this sense, actually, you know, as you basically increase the, the, the threshold or the connectivity, you can see some kind of the different sort of the structure of the topology of the, the point cloud. 
So even you can basically control the threshold of the distance uh, to basically get the certain some topological information for the given the set of the coins. So there's basically a full set of the some theoretical the ideas for that, uh, which is called the persistent homology. Uh, so I recommend you to check that out. Uh, but we are not going to get into that much kind of details for that. So we are also going to discuss some uh, very basic ideas uh, for that. Uh, so that was the question on the Zoom chat. Uh, and also the, my question here was basically, you know, how are we going to basically define some kind of the valid meshes uh, in terms of like forming this kind of the vertices and the edges and the faces? Uh, what would be the cases that we can say that the mesh is kind of the broken or something? Any ideas for that? Yeah, so we can basically think about some kind of the goodness of the mesh in terms of that. So at the end, what we want to do is that we want to basically represent a 2D surface uh, with a this kind of like mesh structure. And we also hope that this kind of the, the, the surface information is also forming a kind of the like the volume in the 3D space, right? So in terms of that, actually, there are some kind of the multiple, some kind of the criteria that we can think about for the kind of the validity of the meshes. Like one of the things for that might be is the uh, kind of the manifoldness uh, in terms of like, you know, basically what we want to do is that what we want to basically make a mesh in terms of like that every local region of the mesh can be mapped to the, the 2D flat plane, right? So if we think about the surface of the some 3D, uh, the volumes, like, you know, the, the, like the, your the body, for example, if we think about the skins of the, the human body, uh, we want to see that basically every local region, the, the skin of the human body, can be mapped to some kind of a flat plane, right? Uh, which means that you know, every local region is really 2D surface, not something kind of arbitrary things. So we basically might want to basically uh, have this kind of the constraints in terms of like when you basically uh, make some kind of the, the meshes. And some kind of the cases that uh, is basically breaking this kind of the condition is, for example, this kind of the case, for example, if we have a single the edge uh, in this 3D space that are basically having the three adjacent faces one more, uh, this will be like one of the examples that this local region, the mesh, it cannot be mapped to the, some kind of the 2D plane. So this is kind of the case of like breaking uh, this kind of the, uh, the condition in terms of the, the local region can be mapped to the 2D flat plane. Uh, so this kind of the condition is called the two manifoldness. Uh, so manifold basically means some kind of the 2D surface. Uh, so which means that basically we want to make the 3D the surface uh, that can have some like all the local regions that can be basically be mappable into the 2D flat plane, uh, roughly speaking. Or the other kind of the cases like breaking this kind of the condition uh, might be basically having a vertex, uh, which is basically having some other adjacent the, the, the triangles uh, but which are basically not forming some kind of the uh, some the 2D surface in 3D space, but just making a kind of the uh, some point in the 3D space. So those are kind of some sort of the invalid uh, the cases of like not having the two manifold needs uh, of the 2D masses. Where there can be some other kind of conditions, for example, uh, uh, we might basically want to uh, form some kind of the 3D volume uh, with some kind of the 2D surface uh, for those kind of the cases. Basically, we should be able to basically, uh, you know, split the 3D space into the some inside region and the outside region, right? Uh, which means that so the, the 2D surface should basically form some kind of the watertight uh, the shape uh, in the 3D space. So that can be one of the condition in terms of that uh, we are having some kind of the 3D mesh, which is basically making some kind of the volume uh, in the 3D space. Uh, where some there can be some other things in terms of that we can have some kind of the topological the constraints. Uh, we can also basically consider having all the surface number having some uh, consistent orientation in terms of that all the numbers are basically having the outside uh, or inside of the shapes. So those kind of the case, those might be kind of the conditions uh, to check some kind of the validity of the meshes. So we are not gonna get into some details for this, uh, but yeah, so those are kind of things. And also if you are more interested in some of these kinds of more like some, some uh, details about some geometry, some the data, uh, you can also check out the other course, the geometry, the, the modeling and the processing. Uh, so this is the, that is basically the course that we are discussing some more details about this kind of some geometric uh, things.
But anyway, uh, so given this kind of the some polygon D mesh, uh, what are the kind of the advantages having this kind of the mesh structure? Actually, there are lots of the some uh, advantages like having this kind of the mesh structure. Uh, one of the good thing is that now we are having the surface information, which means that now we can apply this kind of data into the many applications. For example, now we can render 3D model into the 2D mesh, 2D images. So we can be used for the 2D rendering. And we can also basically uh, add some kind of the more the surface information. For example, we can add some kind of the color information or some kind of the material information. And this is also one of the examples that we are also adding some kind of the uh, geometric texture, uh, like some displacement map uh, for each of the points over the surface. We are also adding some kind of the geometric details in terms of like, for example, like some, some sort of the perturbation uh, over the surface in terms of like adding some geometric details. So we can add this kind of some texture information over the 3D the, the surface. And now we because uh, now we are having the 3D surface in information. And also for many other some applications for the deformation or the manipulation, uh, since now we are uh, now having some the surface information, uh, we can apply this kind of the techniques to manipulate the many kind of 3D data, which means that these types of the data also can be good for so many kind of some simulations. So for many kinds of some physical simulation uh, to check the collision or something else, uh, so having the surface information also can be good. So there are actually lots of the some goodness in terms of like having uh, lots of the applications of the, the polygon the mesh. Uh, what would be the downside uh, in terms, of especially in terms of like processing the data into this 3D neural network? So in the case that when you have the polygon the meshes, if we want to basically directly feed this kind of the polygon the mesh information uh, into some kind of some deep learning kind of the pipelines, uh, what would be kind of the disadvantages for those kind of the cases? Uh, do you have any thoughts? Yeah, obviously one of the kind of issues would be basically the irregular st the structure. So also for the point cloud, we had the same issue in terms of that we do not have any kind of some regularity in the data. And here, while we now have some kind of the connectivity information, the thing is that this kind of connectivity uh, may not be regular, which means that we cannot typically use some kind of some the typical the convolutional the operation. So that can be kind of the one big issue in this case. Uh, actually, there are some kind of the attempts to apply some sort of the convolutional the operation over the meshes as well. Uh, so we are not going to get into some details there. Uh, but if you actually think about like applying some typical the ideas for the convolution the neural net, uh, there will be some kind of the convolution the operation and also the pooling operation in the architecture, right? So actually, it's kind of the doable in terms of applying some convolution the operation because still we can define some kind of the some neighbor the, the, the vertices or the faces. And based on that, we can try to basically aggregate some kind of the local information. But the question might be is that how we can apply some kind of the pooling operation, right? So if we think about like how the pooling the layer works in the 2D convolution the neural network, uh, so the, the role of the pooling operation is basically uh, you know, progressively basically reducing the resolution of the data, right? So when you have some kind of the higher resolution the data, the pooling operation is basically uh, making some kind of the low resolution the data while basically aggregating some kind of the local information. So the question in the, the mesh case might be is that how are we gonna basically define this kind of the pooling operation uh, in terms of like making some kind of the uh, architectures like you know interweaving some convolution and the pooling, right? Uh, do you have any kind of like thoughts in terms of like how we can apply some pooling operation in the mesh case? Can you kind of like come up with some any ideas in terms of like how we can define some pulling operation? So when the pulling is basically the, the operation that can uh, progressively basically reduce the resolution of the data, uh, when you have some kind of a given this 3D mesh, how we can basically do this kind of sort of the progressive, the reduction of the resolution of the, the data.
actually there are some very you know, very the conventional the very traditional the idea in terms of like uh, decreasing the resolution of the meshes which is the technique called the uh, mesh simplification which was introduced in like 1990s so if we see how people worked on basically decreasing the resolution of the meshes before uh, the basic idea for that is this like edge contraction the idea so this was basically the case that we are basically picking one edge uh, in the 3D mesh and basically merging two vertices, uh, which are basically adjacent to the, the edge. So this is the case that we are taking this edge and then we are taking out this edge in a way to basically merge these two vertices. So we can basically, you know, uh, iteratively you know, decrease the resolution of the meshes by basically you know, uh, iterating this operation. So this is the operation that we call the edge collapse or the edge contraction. So by basically iterating this edge contraction, the operation actually we can uh, decrease the resolution of the meshes. And actually, for the some kind of the uh, mesh based the com the convolution of the neural network, actually we can apply the same idea. Uh, so while we are basically decreasing the resolution of the meshes with this kind of the edge contraction the operation, uh, we can do some kind of the pooling kind of operations. So that was basically the idea. Uh, that was like first introduced in the paper called the mesh CNN. Uh, so this was the case that we are having some kind of the information for each of the edges. So for a given kind of the mesh structure, uh, we are having some kind of information for each of the edges. And then we are aggregating this kind of the edge information with the edge contraction. So when you take out this like the edge E, uh, we are get, aggregating the information with these two, like uh, some of the edges that are basically opposite to each other, the B and A. A and also in C and D. Uh, so in this way, we are basically iteratively decreasing the resolution of the meshes. And if, if, if we also do the opposite things, like if we just do all the things in the reverse way, then we can also define the unpooling the operation. So that was this kind of the, uh, some ideas in terms of like using some very conventional ideas of the mesh simplification uh, to apply the same kind of the pooling operation. Uh, to basically do some kind of make some kind of the convolution neural network uh, that can work with the meshes. So there are some these kind of the attempts in terms of like defining some making some kind of the uh, convolution of the neural network that can take the mesh structure as the input. Uh, but obviously the implementation is really uh, complicated. So there are lots of things that because still the structure is not regular, uh, there are some lots of things that you need to uh, specially handle, and also those kind of the ideas were not verified that much kind of the, the, the diversity data set. So I just want to say that there are some attempts to apply some uh, some convolution neural network into the mesh structure, uh, but this is not that common approach because of the main kind of the complexities uh, in the implementation also for many other things. So those are kind of things. Also, in terms of like, you know, using this kind of representation, uh, not for the processing, but also for the generation. So we're also going to get into the point of like how we can make some, like, you know, produce some kind of 3D outputs using the neural network, not just taking that as kind of input, uh, but for the cases of like creating this kind of 3D output uh, using the neural network, also the kind of problem is that it's really challenging to make some kind of the belly mesh. So we also uh, discuss some kind of the multiple criteria in terms of like defining some kind of the validity of the meshes. So in terms of like creating some kind of valid meshes, it's also really challenging to basically satisfy all the conditions in the final the outputs. And also there are some kind of the attempts to make some kind of 3D meshes directly using the neural network. Uh, and this was also the work which was introduced just like three years ago in the 2020. And their idea, was actually quite straightforward. So actually there's already kind of some neural network that can produce some kind of the sequential data, right? Like for, this, for example, for the like ChatGPT, for many kind of the large language models, they are basically producing some kind of the sequential data as the outputs. So their idea is basically using, directly using this kind of the, some auto regressive model that can produce some kind of sequence of the data uh, to produce the sequence of the vertices and the sequence of the faces. So this is basically the case that we are somehow sorting all the vertices and the faces in the given 3D model in some specific way, then, then we are basically producing all the sequence of the vertices and the faces uh, using some very conventional the neural, the neural network architectures that can basically produce the, all the, uh, the sequential data. So for those kind of the cases, uh, we can basically make the, a sequence of the vertices and sequence of the faces based on that, 
Uh, and these were basically the outputs of the some generation. So as you can see, for some of the cases, actually the output looks quite good in terms of like the output really looks like some kind of the belly matches. But for some other the cases, as you can see in the red circles, you can see that for many of the cases, the output looks really bad because like when you have like very you know, small kind of the mistakes in terms of like having some kind of the wrong prediction for any of the single the vertices and the faces, uh, we are getting some you know, very poor the outputs, which is basically missing some, you know, totally missing some of the big regions in these three outputs. So those are kind of the limitations when you basically try to directly produce all the three D messages using the neural network. So those are kind of some some kind of the uh some downsides of like using the pol the polygon dimensions at the three D representations. Obviously, there are also more the kind of the complicated uh sort of kind of the representations of the many three D data. So also the CAD representations are uh, basically used in some many kind of the CAD applications. For example, it's not just having the, the meshes, basically vertices, edges, and the faces, but having some more like high level information, like some primitives, like having some cubes and the spheres and the cylinders, and also some kind of the parametric the curves, uh, some base point kind of things, and also the vegetative surfaces, parametric surfaces as well. So we are also not gonna get into some more details about this kind of some parametric representations of the 3D models. If you are also interested, interested in this kind of like some parametric representations, uh, you can also check out the geometric modeling and the processing of the course. So that's the course that we are also discussing some more details about this kind of some parametric representations. So those kind of representations can also be used in many kinds of the applications, but typically these representations are not used uh, for some many kind of some processing architectures, uh, some encoding architectures, ar architectures uh, taking those things as the inputs but we can basically make some kind of neural architectures that can produce uh, these representations as the outputs. But obviously the challenge might be is that, you know, how we make some of these kind of the, uh, the outputs with these representation uh, with some kind of the valid shapes. So there might be some more constraints in terms of like making some valid outputs uh, with these kind of some higher level representations. So that might be also kind of the cases. Uh, here the question is that has GNS ever been used to deal with the meshes? Spaces might be able to be handled by clean. Yeah, so that's a really good question. Actually, you know, we can see that the meshes is kind of some extended version of the, the graph structure. So as we uh, know some kind of the neural network that can handle some kind of graph structure, uh, we can consider using this kind of architectures to handle the meshes, right? And also even for the point cloud, it, it can uh, first, define some kind of the connectivity across the points based on their the proximity and apply some kind of the graph neural network architectures. So that's also kind of the uh, things that people tried. So we're, we're going to also get into that point. Actually, the architectures dealing with some kind of the point cloud data is kind of a simpler version of the GNN. Actually, also the variants of the architectures dealing with the point cloud uh, can be seen as kind of the some another version of the graph neural network. So we're gonna also discuss some kind of this kind of the analogy between the GNN and also the architecture dealing with the point class. So that's also what we are going to do uh, in some other lectures. Uh, that's also a really good question. Any other questions for these representations? Cool. Yeah, so those are basically some of the representations for this video there. Actually, there are more, uh, but these four might be some kind of the representative. Uh, representations for the 3D data, uh, having the voxels and the mesh, the multiple view images and the point cloud and the meshes. So if we basically see the kind of the pros and the cons of each of the representation, uh, let's see this table. So in terms like, you know, precisely describing all the details of the geometry of the 3D data, uh, voxels may not be good uh, because like, you know, if we want to capture all the details of the geometric, some, the geometry of the given this 3D data, uh, we might really need to uh, have some very high resolution of the voxels, uh, which might be also very inefficient. So there might be kind of a, uh, some kind of downside of the voxels. For the multi-view images, also the thing is that this is not the representation that can directly represent all the geometry. So in terms of that, see, this is also not the ideal representation to capture all the details of the geometry, but still from the multi-build images, uh, we can also try to recover the 3D shapes. 
So we are also going to get into that point in terms of like how we can recover the 3D geometry from the, uh, the multi-view images. So that's kind of things. Also point cloud may not be the ideal the representation in terms of like representing all the geometric details because like this is not the representation that can have the surface information. So that can be also kind of a downside. Uh, so in terms of like geometric fidelity, the best representation might be uh, basically the mesh. So that basically contains all these, the surface information. Also for the efficiency, uh, mesh might be the best representation, right? Uh, because we can have some the minimal set of the vertices and the faces to capture all the, uh, some of the surface information. Uh, point cloud might be okay in terms of that we can just like having some a set of the points. But if we want to capture all the details, then we also need to have some more the, the points. So that's not good. Uh, the voxels and the multi-view images may might be basically the worst representation in terms of like the efficiency. And also for some kind of the applications like rendering, obviously for the rendering, uh, meshes might be good. Uh, also the multi-view images are already having the rendered the outputs. So these are also the good uh, kind of cases. But for the manipulation, uh, you know, if we want to basically change the shape, like if we want to basically you know, you know, change the articulation of the human bodies, for example, for those kind of the cases like voxels, uh, the multiple images and the point cloud may not be good because we are not having some direct uh, the surface information. So meshes might be the best case for the manipulations. For the generation, actually yeah, generating some voxel the representation is actually quite easy because we know how we can do these things for the 2D images as well. Uh, so in terms of like generation, the voxels might be good, uh, but obviously the quality of the output may not be good because of the, uh, the lack of the, the resolution. And also for the generation, the point cloud generation is quite easy, quite an easy thing because like there is no uh, constraints in terms of the validity, uh, but if we want to, uh, make some kind of the mesh structure, uh, obviously it's not that easy because of the lots of kind of the conditions for the validity shapes. Uh, and also the regularity, uh, this is kind of the most important part uh, in terms of like designing some kind of the, uh, some 3D encoders. So if you want to make some kind of the encoders uh, for the these types of the representations, uh, voxels might be easy because it has some already regular structure. Multiple might be also the easy uh, in terms of those. So it has also the regular the structures but the point cloud and the meshes might be challenging in terms of that they are not having any kind of the regular structures in the data. So it, it means that we might need to make some kind of some specialized architectures to deal with this kind of the point cloud data and also the mesh the data. So those are kind of things. Any questions on this? Actually, there are also many other the types of the representations for the 3D data. So one important representation that we did not discuss so far uh, is the impulsive representation. Uh, so this is also kind of things that we are going to discuss in the later the lectures. The basic idea for the impulsive representation is that now we are describing a 3D shape as a function. So there is no any kind of some explicit representation, but any every single 3D shape is now represented as a function in terms of that the function takes a 3D coordinates as the input and basically outputting some kind of information like the occupancy or the some kind of sign the distance. For example, like we can have the volume information by having the 3D grid and having the some occupancy information for each of the, the voxels. But instead of that, what we can have is that we can have a function that takes the 3D coordinates uh, in the 3D space as the input and basically saying whether the point is inside or the outside or whether the point is like how, how much that the point is close to the surface. So those are another kind of the types of the way that uh, we are representing some 3D data. So the problem of like this representation is that this, rep this function representation, some implicit representation cannot be used as kind of input to the neural net because the representation is already the function. So it's not that kind of trivial uh, to basically take this kind of representation as the input uh, but still this representation can be used uh, for the output for some like some decoding the architectures. So we are also going to discuss that idea in terms of like, you know, how we can basically produce a function as the output of the neural net. Actually, this is the case that we can achieve the best, the quality of the outputs in 3D generation. So we are going to get into that point. And also what we are going to do actually, so we only have the five minutes uh, today, uh, but for the next lecture, what we are going to discuss is that 
how we can also convert like one new presentation to the other. Uh, so before that, one point here is that a part of the multi view don't all these sensors produce point cloud? Don't you assume there is some post process for the analysis when they are multi fair compared? Yeah, actually, so there might be some kind of cases. Like for some of the cases, for example, that we are dealing with some kind of scan data, some raw scan data, the input data might be the points, right? But for some of the other the cases that we are dealing with some kind of 3D CAD models, the, the, the data that we have might be basically the matches, right? For, so depending on the, the, the problems and depending on the data that we have, actually we might need to uh, use some kind of the different the, the architectures that can deal with either the matches or the point clouds, uh, or we can consider doing some kind of the conversion. So even when you have some kind of the mesh data set, we can convert all the meshes into the point cloud and use some kind of architectures that can process the point cloud data. Or even when you have some kind of the point cloud data as the input, for example, for the scan data, we can consider like converting all the point cloud into some other representation into the meshes or some input representation in a way that we can utilize this data set uh, for some kind of the, some applications, for example, for rendering or some manipulation for many things. Uh, if we are taking the point cloud as input, we basically might need to convert this point cloud into the other representation. So this is kind of like very important part in terms of like building with the 3D data set. Even when you have some kind of the meshes as the input or the point cloud as the input, how we can say you know, convert this representation into the other representation in a way that we can utilize all these data into some, you know, some other the applications. So that's basically uh, very critical things in terms of like the many of the geometry, the processing the problems. So let's think about like how we can basically do some like all the conversion across the all the uh the representations. So how can you convert the implicit function into the voxels? This might be the easiest way, right? So given any kind of the function that is basically checking like you know, given any kind of 3D coordinates, uh, we can say whether the point is like inside or the outside of the 3D shape. Uh, if we have this kind of a function, then how can you convert this into the voxels? This is quite straightforward, right? Because we can just like evaluate the function um, in a way that you know we can basically fill all the voxels in the 3D grid, right? So this is the kind of very easiest, uh, the easiest kind of conversion from the implicit function to the voxels. How about from the mesh to the point cloud? How can you basically generate the point cloud from the meshes? This is also very straightforward, right? We just need to sample the points over the surface. So this is just a matter of like the sampling points over the meshes. So this conversion is also very straightforward, right? So the other the conversion might be is from the mesh to the multi-view images, which is also very straightforward in terms of that we can we just need to render all the meshes into the 2D the images uh, to the planes. So if you took the compact graphics course, like the rendering is basically very typical things, right? So this kind of the convert conversion might be very easy and very straightforward. Uh, the problem might be in the other the convergence, for example, from the voxels to the mesh, uh, how we can convert the voxels into the mesh, right? So if we can also have this connection from the voxels to the meshes, uh, we might need some the other way around. So now we can see this kind of sequence from the input function to the voxels, uh, voxels to the meshes, and the meshes to the point cloud. So which means that we can do this kind of sequential the kind of conversion uh, from the input function to the point cloud. And then the question might be is that how we can also do the other way around when you have the point cloud as the input, for example, like some scan data, how we can convert this into the implicit function. So if we can basically make, make, you know, make this kind of bridges from the voxels to the meshes and the point cloud to the implicit function, which means that we can convert like one representation to the all the other representation, right? So we are basically making a loop from the input function to the voxels, voxels to the meshes, uh, mesh to the point cloud, and point cloud again to the input function. So if we can make this kind of loop, then we can do any kind of conversion from the any representation to the other representation. So this is kind of the crucial things in terms of that you know, we can basically uh, you know, change the representation of the 3D data to whatever things that we want to use. So you know, if we can make like these two bridges, uh, from the voxels to the mesh and the point cloud in the input function, then we can do uh, you know, conversion from the any representation to the any other representation. So these two things are that we are going to discuss in the next time. So next time we are going to uh, discuss the two ideas like converting the voxels to the meshes and also the point cloud input function in a way that now we can do any kind of the conversion from the one representation to the other representation. 
And then we're going to start to discuss the basic idea in terms of like processing this 3D data as the input uh, in the neural network. So that's it for today. Any questions for the only 3D representation? Is there a generation using point cloud and change to mesh in the rendering? Uh, yes, actually there is a work like generating point cloud as the output and also converting that into the mesh for the rendering. But actually the thing is that uh, we will see that point cloud can be good representation for encoding to process the data as the input, but the point cloud may not be the ideal representation uh, to generate the 3D as the output uh, as the, for the generation of the tasks. Actually, for the generation of the task, the ideal representation is the implicit the, the representation. Uh, because from the implicit, uh, implicit the function, we can uh, basically capture all the details while also changing that representation to the any other representations. So we will get into that point, like what's the kind of the best representation for each of the tasks. Any other questions? Cool. Uh, so we will get into the point of like the some representation, the conversion, the next time, and then after that, oh, go one more question. Can you quickly render point cloud without knowing the surface information before it? Yeah, actually, that's also a good question. Uh, there are actually some well-known techniques in terms of like how we can render point cloud directly uh, without having the surface information. So that's the idea that people call like. Subfill uh, representation. Uh, it's not a representation, basically rendering the point cloud directly into the, the images. Uh, and for that, typically, so the basic idea uh, rendering the point cloud is to basically represent every single point as kind of the small disk in this 3D space. So it's also the same as kind of like we are defining some kind of the radius uh, for each of the point and basically you know, represent each of the point as kind of the small disk, where you can actually represent each of the point as the small sphere in this 3D space and render that into the 3Ds, uh, into the 2D images. And this kind of the idea can be effective in the case that when basically we, when you have some uh, very dense this 3D point cloud, uh, but if we have some very sparse point cloud, obviously there might be lots of the artifacts that we can see in the 2D images. But yeah, actually uh, people uh, started to work on this kind of like some point cloud representation uh, when you start to see some kind of these 3D scanning devices only 2000, and at the time, many people try to basically directly use the point cloud representation for many applications. Uh, so at the time, people also introduced the idea of like direct point cloud rendering using the software, the idea, uh, which is still used in some kind of the cases, but now mostly people just try to convert uh, point cloud into the mesh or some other representation uh, to use uh, in the many applications. Any other questions for those things? 3D representation. Okay, if there's no more question, we're gonna continue discussing the idea of like some representation deconversion in the next lecture, in the next Monday. So I will see you next Monday. Okay, thank you, bye.